Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Danielle Redden. I grew up in this church. Many of you know that, and I'm all grown up. Look how big I am. (laughs) Today, I invite you to partake in what I like to refer to as story time with Danielle. Many of my friends, whether they be at school or growing up, know that I love to tell stories, and so I invite you to join with me in this story today. The story we are talking about and entering into is from John 13. In this portion of the Gospel of John, it comes in at the night that Jesus was betrayed. The same night in which we see the first communion being given. While our scripture takes the end of the story, I'm going to give you a little bit of context. This is the story of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. In the middle of the meal, Jesus stops. He gets up, takes off his robe, puts on what a servant might wear, grabs what I imagine would be a basin, and proceeds to wash the feet of his disciples. Now, washing the feet in Middle Eastern culture way back then isn't uncommon. Feet, when you're walking on very dusty roads, get very dirty. Here in America, where we have a lot of pavement, it might not be a problem. But I spent four months in Uganda in which every day I was wearing sandals, walking on red dirt, and believe me, they get very dirty. At one point, I wanted to paint my toenails, and it took 10 minutes of scrubbing for my feet to turn from red to white again. It makes sense why feet would be washed. The part of the story that's a little bit odd is that Jesus is washing the feet. Jesus, who is Lord and teacher, is taking the position of a servant. And that's where our story comes in, because as Jesus gets to Peter, Peter stops and says, Lord, no, don't wash my feet. We all know Peter, he tends to object at the wrong times and interject at the wrong times. So Jesus corrects him, Peter, if I don't wash you, you aren't clean. Peter says, okay, Lord, then wash all of me. And we slap our heads. Peter, what are you doing? Jesus looks at Peter and says, No, I only need to wash your feet. So comes in our scripture. John 13, 12 to 17. When he had finished washing their feet, he, being Jesus, put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. This is the word of the Lord. Do you understand what I have done for you? Is what Jesus asks. So we look, and as good disciples, we see, what has Jesus done? Well, he's washed some really grimy, disgusting feet. Is that it? Well, it's Jesus, so I'm going to, you know, take it on a limb and say, no, that's probably not all he's doing. In fact, Jesus, by removing his robe and going to wash the feet of the disciples, has effectively removed the distance between himself and them. Jesus has crossed a barrier, a cultural barrier, a respect barrier, in which Teacher doesn't do things for disciple. Disciple does things for teacher. But Jesus has defied all of those expectations and gone and crossed that barrier in order to serve his disciples. 
the question still remains, do you understand what I have done for you? And Peter can probably say an emphatic, no, I do not understand. I say this only because he objected while it was happening. But why? Why did Peter object? Peter could not receive the service of Christ because in order to receive something, you need to be okay with the person giving it to you. You need to be okay that that person can and is able and is allowed to give it to you. Jesus as teacher, it caught Peter off guard. Teachers don't serve. That's not right. That's not allowed. But Jesus didn't have this problem. Earlier in the Gospels, we see he's lounging and a woman comes in and begins to serve him by anointing his head with perfume. The disciples once again freak out. Jesus, no, she shouldn't be doing this. No, 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 no. We'll take it, give it to the poor. Jesus takes a breath. No, no. It is right for her to do this. She is preparing me. Jesus had no problem accepting the woman's service to himself because he saw that she was worthy of giving it to him. In the same way, Jesus also has no problem serving others because he sees that he is worthy of doing that. Later on in our passage, he says, wash one another's feet. This one another is what I want to focus on because later on in John 13, verse 34, Jesus commands, love one another. Now, when we think of loving one another, it's easy. I love you. That's it. No. One another naturally means I love you, you love me. I give love, I receive love. You give love, you receive love. So when we look at Jesus saying, wash one another's feet, serve one another, this can't be a one-way service. The whole concept of one another, Jesus creates a community in which I serve you, you serve me. I receive service, I give it. You receive service, you give it. Another word for this is mutuality. Mutuality is just that, the simple giving and receiving on the same plane. It's like playing cards. Mutuality is the difference between old maid and go fish. The games are pretty simple. Go fish, you try to get as many pairs of cards as you can, and if somebody else doesn't have it, you grab a card from the middle. Old Maid has a similar premise. You're trying to get rid of all of your cards by getting pairs. The catch is, you have to get your cards from everybody else. There is no, I grab to the middle. I grab to the left, I give to the right. Or I grab from the right and I give to the left. There's no, Danielle decides to grab all the cards in the middle because there aren't any. You have to interact with everybody else. That's mutuality. And because of mutuality, because that's the nature of the community Christ has called us to, community and therefore service, it takes time. You can't be that one person doing it all and only serving, or doing it all and only receiving. It's a both and. In our passage, Jesus continues saying, I have set an example for you. Do as I have done to you. Or as I like to say, go and do likewise. For myself in reading it, it makes me pause and say, okay, if I am to go and do like Jesus, well, how? How do I do like Jesus? And in this passage, I can't help but look at the larger context. Jesus stands up and asks his disciples, do you understand what I have done for you? But this 
is not just any ordinary night. This is not just Jesus washing feet. This is the night that he was betrayed. This is the night before, in a few hours, Christ is taken to the high priest and condemned. The next day, he sits and is hearing the people shouting, crucify him. In a few hours, he is on a cross, dying for the world. I can't help but think that when Jesus is asking these questions, it's not only about the feet. What else is he about to do? What did he actually do? Philippians 2, 6 through 8 says, Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. God became man, but why? Is it because he wanted to? It doesn't seem the most pleasurable thing in the world. On a day like this, I am hot and sweaty and very nervous, and my human experience doesn't seem like the greatest thing in the world. Why would the God of the universe want to come and be one of me, one of you? No, it's not because of a pleasurable getaway and vacation. Christ came because way in the beginning, man fell, and we became broken, and our relationship with God became broken. And in turn, our relationship with each other didn't go right. That's why Cain and Abel, death ended up being the result of that brotherhood. Because our world isn't perfect, and we, we don't fit right. We're cracked. We're shattered. Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus says, go and do likewise. We serve like Jesus, by remembering the place from which we were served by Jesus. When we come to that place, when we know, we know exactly why we need to be saved. I know what I do wrong. I might not tell everybody else, but I know where I hurt. I know where I'm not perfect. Sometimes it's a lot more obvious than others. I don't need to tell you what's gone wrong in your lives. You've lived them. But by remembering these things, by recognizing that they're true, we enter into a community where we can serve. When we see how broken that we are, we can empathize with those who feel just as shattered as us. Who feel perhaps even farther from God and farther from any type of great life as we ever have. Brokenness is the human experience. And as the human experience, it's experienced by all humans. Every single one of us have experienced in some way, shape, or form that emptiness, that all is not right. Whether it be something in our own lives or seeing just the way this world is functioning, no, something's not right. And it's in that no moment that suddenly I can relate to somebody else who is in that no moment. I am not foreign to that. 
I am not foreign to your struggles because I struggle too. Wash one another's feet. Serve one another. The community that we serve in involves mutuality. It's the giving and the taking of human life experience, and human life experience includes brokenness. Therefore, when we serve others, it isn't just our actions that are giving and taking. By sharing of myself, I am also sharing where I have fallen. By sharing of myself and where I have fallen, I can enter in with you and have you share with me who you are, where you have fallen. This giving and taking isn't just for actions and isn't just for the good and the greats and the hopes. It's for the hurts. We serve and share our lives, our hurts, our hopes, and our dreams. This isn't as a quick fix. This community that we are called to, this communal service that we are called to in Christ, isn't just a, okay, once and I'm done. And it's really easy to say, yeah, yeah, I know blah, blah, blah. But think about it. How often do we walk away from sitting and listening to something and say, okay, now I feel really guilty that I haven't served anybody. So for this one day, I'm going to give someone food and then I'm not going to do it ever again because now I feel really good about myself. Now I'm okay because the guilt's gone. That's not the kind of service that we are being called to. Service through community requires mutual investment. Investments are like friendships. If we're thinking relationally, an investment, although financially in a bank, might be leaving the money there for a long period of time and not touching it. You can't invest in something and then say, Okay, the next day I expect all these funds. It doesn't work that way. So I am told. I am really financially mm, not so smart. Which is why I'd rather think of it relationally. I like to say I invest in people. Now, I'm only 21 going on 22. There are many of you who have a lot more life experience than I do. But I can't think that a friendship for 10, 15, 50 years happens because you meet someone once and then maybe forget their name. We meet so many people every day. Think about it. In an average week, how many people do you interact with and do you talk to? It isn't for meeting someone that an investment is made or else I would have a lot more friends than I do. Why is it that at the end of everything, statistics say that we might only come out with five to ten really lifelong friends? It's because in the period of 50 years, you're talking to someone over and over and over again. And it's not just you talking at them. With my friends, I want to know what's involved in their lives. On returning from Uganda, I'm in a little bit of a dilemma because I have friends 7,000 miles away. Talk about long distance. Now, people say long distance relationships are difficult. Why is that? Because you don't see them every day. You don't talk to them regularly. With technology now, it's possible, but it still takes effort. Relationships over time, again and again and again, require meeting, require sharing life, require me wanting to know about you and in turn wanting to share myself with you. Wanting you to share yourself with me. 
service takes the same route. Service in community, a mutual investment, isn't giving some nameless person something. The service that we are called to, that Christ says, go and do likewise, wash one another, is knowing that other. Who are you in who I wash feet? Am I going to let you wash mine? Because that's what I'm called to do. In the same way that as through our brokenness we are able to empathize with those who are also broken, it's only when we see how far that God went to get us, to bring us back to himself, that we are willing to go that distance for others. The God of the universe crossed a barrier. While Christ crossed a barrier from being Lord to being servant and washing feet, he did more than just that. He was Lord of the universe. And he crossed a barrier and became servant as in man. God went so much farther than putting on a robe and grabbing a basin. He came out of his kingdom and came down and started walking on dusty roads. He went as far in obedience and in love to the next day after this night to hang on a cross. God went farther than any of us could ever go. For you and for me, and for us. And if God says, do you understand what I have done for you? Go and do likewise. We need to take seriously what does that mean? And what does that look like? When I see what God has done for me, and I am told to go and do likewise, I cannot take that lightly. I cannot go willy-nilly, just kind of service here and service there, as great as that is. Wash one another's feet. Because it's only through fellowship with Jesus that we can have that fellowship with one another. So what does this week look like for you? I don't know. For me, I'm working and, you know, there's a lot that goes into that. This isn't, this type of mutuality and this type of investment typically doesn't undergo a grandiose experience of, boom, I've done this amazing thing and now I'm serving you and knowing you forever and ever. Probably not. My second year in college, I met this girl named Carenza. And I really liked her from the start. Carenza was a bit standoffish, and I wasn't sure if she would ever like me, but it didn't really matter. I liked her. So I determined that every time I saw her, I was going to inform her of this fact. And going to be as spunky and joyous because I couldn't help it. I'm the type of person that if I get excited, I really can't help but show it. It just comes out like a firecracker. So I saw Carenza, like, Carenza, hello, how are you? Oh, thank you for being my friend. This is day two, and she's like, okay, I'm going to walk this way now. <laughs> a semester in college is four months, and so for four months, every time I saw Carenza, I greeted her pretty much the same way. She's very, very patient with me. Five months go by, six months go by, and soon I say, hi, Carenza, and she goes, hi, Danielle. Like, yes! I got a hello. Six months, seven months, eight months, and by nine months, me and Carenza are chatting. Two years later, we're really good friends. She's very dear to my heart. But our friendship didn't come about some one and done. 
Even my experience in Uganda for four months, being with 21 other girls, that one moment doesn't bind us for eternity. With my friends in Texas and in California and in Uganda, I have to continually say, hey, how are you? What'd you eat? This one moment unlike what Christ did for us, doesn't define our service. We don't have the eternity factor. So what does this week look like for you? We have coffee fellowship. Maybe it's just popping in and asking someone else, how have you been? I haven't talked to you in a while. When Christ says serve one another, he's not just talking about strangers. We are the one another. We are our own community. Looking at other communities and realizing that we are one and the same. So maybe after church it's simply going up to someone you haven't spoken to, you don't typically speak to, and wanting to know about their lives. Calling someone, asking, hey, I haven't seen you in a while, are you doing okay? following up with the people that we say we're praying for and asking, has God worked in your life? How can I be there for you? And in turn, when somebody wants to be there for you, accepting that that's okay. You can be there for me as well. This Wednesday, we have Peace of Bread, and I am so excited that our church doesn't get to do this every week. That we have such a broad community of people who want to serve that we only get once in every 12 or 15 weeks to do it ourselves. It's amazing. But that makes the opportunity even greater. What does that look like? Maybe it's sitting down with someone. Maybe it's deciding you're going to get to know that one individual. So every single time you come in, you know their name. You know where they're at in life. Maybe it's coming in other times when we aren't serving as our church downstairs. They're here every week. Maybe it's twice a month. Maybe it's once a month. Maybe it's every week. And if every week is what you already do, then do you know the lives and stories and hurts and loves of every single person you care for? Probably not. How can you serve better? How can you serve communally? How can you let them serve you? We're not islands. We're not playing go fish. We're playing old maid. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> if your service you find is outside of the church, that's great. That's fine. We're still in community. <laughs> Maybe it's simply at work or on your way back and forth. You see the same person every single time. Maybe it's time to learn their name. When I got home from Uganda, it surprised me. Me and my mom were going to go get gas at like the place down there where the guy gives it to you. And it's nothing unusual. We've pretty much gone to that gas station my whole life. But this time, she rolled down and she called the man by name and he called her Liz and I was just like, what? <laughs> For some reason, in all the times we'd gone to that gas station, it never occurred to me to ask his name. It was always, 20 regular, please. Fill it up regular, please. But all of a sudden, he has a name and he is a person with struggles and hopes and a family just like me. And it was amazing. And I was so happy. I was smiling all goofy like, oh, hey. <laughs> because... I suddenly got to know the person who had always been serving us. Mutuality is the effort of getting to know and also to be known, as Christ has done the same for you. 
So we're back. The upper room is silent. Peter just got scolded. Nobody really wants to say anything. The room is silent, but as Jesus puts on his robes, minds are buzzing. What is this man going to say next? He has done so many things we didn't expect him to. And Jesus stands and he looks at the disciples and asks, Do you understand what I have done for you? Go and do likewise. So come, let us wash the feet of one another, as Christ has done for each one of us. Thank you.